Hi. Hello, everyone. Yeah, we will continue our committee meeting in a few seconds, OK? Uh, the following people uh, will be the first panel. Lynn Kelly, Eli DeWalkin, and Jonathan Rosenberg. Uh, please get ready, yeah. And I also want to thank everyone for your patience for this long, long meeting. Uh, please identify yourself and you may begin. Hi, good afternoon, Council. My name is Lynn Kelly. I'm the Executive Director of New Yorkers for Parks. I stand here today also repre representing the now 210 organizations in the Playfair Coalition. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. I want to rather um, divert a little bit from my testimony, which my team is going to give to you, and respond directly to some of the questions and issues that were raised today. I speak from a position of both being an advocate, having worked at a city agency that distributes capital projects, and having run an organization that received substantial capital money for projects. Um, I echo the frustration. Parks has done quite a lot to improve its process, but I'm gonna ask the council just point blank, where is OMB? Where is MOX? Where's the law department? Where is PDC? Why aren't they here today, and why aren't they receiving the same amount of questioning with vigor that the Parks Department has received for at least, as I've been present, four hearings that I've seen? It's an important piece of the process when 70% of your procurement process is outside of your control. I'll also add from experience that while uh, Parks is correct that some of these regulatory agencies might have 30 days to approve or move whatever the next step is. It's not like a ULERP clock where they're actually required within that 30-day period. So someone can, in fact, sit on a contract and decide on the 30th day they need another two weeks or another two days. And again, I don't think it's fair to put the Parks Department in a position to tell on or report on its other sister agencies that it's required to work with. Um, I'll also say that for many years, we've been advocating for the Parks Department to have a discretionary capital budget, uh, which it, it used to have. It no longer does at the level at which it did. But more importantly, it also needs to have a fully funded needs assessment. How can an agency realistically plan for uh, anticipating what's going to happen in the field and on a design and construction budget when it doesn't actually have a needs assessment and fully funded? And the rate at which it's being funded, it's going to take 20 years. We find that accept unacceptable. Um, we think it's worth highlighting the positive changes. Uh, as of now, Parks is the only, one of the only agencies to actually be fully transparent by putting capital projects on its website. Um, I would love to see some transparency at how long it takes the other mayoral agencies. You know, for example, I would love to see data on how long it takes OMB to approve capital projects or the law department to improve contracts through the procurement process. That data is not actually available to us on a regular basis unless it's uh, procured through um, legal action, and often that takes a long time. Um, as park advocates, we've been to at least three hearings. This feels like deja vu. This might be my personal fourth, and I really hope that there's a citywide approach, not just a parks department approach. Parks is trying. You know, it's. As an advocate, we don't always agree with the Parks Department, but this is one where it's really unfair to continue to point the finger and to continue to have everybody come and spend a lot of time on this issue when the sister agencies that have a significant piece of the process are not here to actually be questioned as well. So we ask for the City Council to really take this up as a citywide issue, please, and to call those agencies to task. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, Chairman Ku Kalos Gibson and committee members. I'm Jonathan Rosenberg, the Director of Budget Review at the New York City Independent Budget Office. Thank you for providing me the opportunity to testify today regarding methods to improve the efficiency of Parks Department's capital projects. IBO provides nonpartisan information on the city's budget to members of the council, other elected officials, and the public. In that role, we often receive questions regarding the Parks Department's capital budget. 
These questions range from the status of a local project to broader questions about the city's capital budgeting process. While we're able to provide information on changes in the overall budget and shifts in funding for specific projects, we often find it difficult to track and identify the cause of project delays and cost overruns, the questions IBO most frequently receives. Identifying the cost of delay or a cost overrun for a specific project is challenging given the nature of the data provided in the capital commitment plan, the city's capital planning document. The capital commitment plan provides few details on the planned timeframes of capital projects. It contains a milestone field that in theory indicates the project's current status along with projected start and end dates for phases of the capital process. Unfortunately, these fields are often left blank. In addition, even when the information is included, it's rarely up to date. Recognizing cost overruns in city budget documents is similarly difficult. The commitment plan is divided by budget lines and further subdivided by projects. The project in the commitment plan may represent discrete work or it may be for a bundle of similar projects. While the commitment plan provides the total funding plan for a project, there's little detail on funding for the project's individual components. Moreover, it's often unclear if funding levels represent total estimated costs of the projects. If funding is increased in subsequent plans, it can be difficult to discern whether the new funding levels represent an increase in cost, change in scope, or if the additional funds are part of the initial cost estimate, but are just newly reflected in the city's budget documents. Earlier this year, IBO testified before the Committee on Parks and Recreation on Intro 161, a proposed bill to require additional data disclosures related to parks capital delays and cost overruns to be included in the Parks Department's capital project tracker. We're generally in favor of the city providing more and better information to further oversight by the council, IBO, and others that would help to improve the capital budgeting process. As we testified previously, without access to capital project details, it is difficult for IBO and others to determine the source of inefficiencies in an agency's capital program. It's important to note that difficulties in identifying delays and cost overruns is not limited to the Parks Department. It is something we encounter with capital projects citywide. Parks Department capital projects by their nature are very visible and often garner considerable public scrutiny, more so than projects for most agencies. The Parks Department is certainly not the only agency encountering capital project management issues. Uh, as a lot of discussion has been today, there's no need for the Parks Department to reinvent the wheel when it comes to best practices in capital project management, particularly when there are a number of promising concepts already underway at other city agencies that have been discussed today. Particularly uh, DDC, as we mentioned, has issued a strategic blueprint aimed at improving its capital project delivery process. DDC's plan focuses on ways that the agency could streamline the construction and procurement process, including expanding use of innovative project delivery methods, such as design build, prioritizing comprehensive front end planning in an effort to minimize the number of time consuming changes, and improving the agency's outreach efforts. These ideas and others used in different construction agencies could be of value in making the Parks Department's capital process more efficient. In summary, without better data, a thorough analysis of the Parks Department's capital program is difficult, if not impossible. More granular and updated information would allow the Council, IBO, and other oversight agencies to identify bottlenecks to make recommendations on how to improve efficiency in the capital process. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, my name is Eli Dvorkin. I'm the Editorial and Policy Director at the Center for an Urban Future. Thank you to the committee for the opportunity to testify today. As you may know, CUF is a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank focused on expanding economic opportunity and strengthening communities across all five boroughs. Last summer, we published a new leaf, a major new analysis of New York City's aging parks infrastructure. Our report found that the average New York City park is now 73 years old and that parks in every borough are struggling with aging assets that are at or near the end of their useful lives, including drainage systems, retaining walls, bulkheads, and bridges. Upgrading this essential urban infrastructure comes at a cost. Over the past decade, state of good repair needs, which include major infrastructure and capital repairs, increased by 53% from 401.4 million in fiscal year 2009 to 615.6 million today. Yet just 36% of these needs are funded and planned in the current capital budget. But funding alone won't be enough. To make lasting progress, every capital dollar will have to stretch much further than it does today. Uh, however, the city's capital design, procurement, and construction processes remain deeply flawed in general, and especially lengthy and frustrating when it comes to parks. While more progress is needed to improve project delivery across the city, the Parks Department has made significant strides under Commissioner Silver's leadership. The department has implemented several effective time-saving measures, as we heard about previously, including standardizing designs and minimizing changes in the construction phase, and as a result, the majority of new projects are meeting their benchmarks. 
But building on this momentum will require a major effort to streamline and improve the planning and procurement phases, where projects end up mired in a scoping and approvals process that includes the Parks Department, but also elected officials, community groups and community boards, and multiple oversight agencies, including but not limited to OMB and the controller. Now, elected officials can also play a vital role in all of this, improving the process by ensuring that funded projects do not change in scope after planning is underway. To continue improving the capital process for the city's public parks, we recommend four critical next steps. First, as my colleague just mentioned, to improve accountability and increase, trans increase transparency, the Parks Department should expand the capital projects tracker to include the dates projects were fully funded, project projected in actual cost overruns and time changes, scope changes, and most importantly, the reasons for specific delays, and intro 161 could help with that. In addition, Mayor de Blasio and the City Council should hold every agency with a role in the capital construction process accountable to the goal of delivering capital projects more efficiency, efficiently. This will require an interagency effort, uh, as my, as my, uh, uh, my colleague uh, Lynn Kelly mentioned, with Council oversight as a key role to reform processes at the Department of Design and Construction, at OMB, the Public Design Commission, uh, working with the Controller's Office, and every other agency with a role to play here, MOX and the Law Department, uh, all have a major role to play. In addition, the council should support a larger dedicated capital budget for the Parks Department so that the department can prioritize infrastructure projects truly based on need. The city should establish state of good repair capital funding that meets these needs, roughly $600 million over the next three years, to be allocated at the discretion of the commissioner and targeted to revitalize aging infrastructure. And this should be done in tandem with fully supporting the needs assessment that is currently underway, that has made tremendous progress, but that needs significant new resources to be able to, com to be completed in the next couple of years rather than couple of decades. And finally, the council should support further increases in maintenance staff. To its credit, the City Council approved the largest increase in expense funding for the Parks Department in a generation this past year, but further investments will be needed. For instance, the Parks Department's full-time headcount is still about one-third lower than it was back in the early 1970s, and the system's masons, plumbers, gardeners, and other skilled tradespeople are stretched thin. An increase in skilled maintenance workers now is an investment in prolonging the life of parks infrastructure in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, yeah. Uh, I have a comment for uh, Lynn Kelly. You know, it's, it's, it's our intention to invite other agencies to come too. Uh, but the administration said the parks can do it on their own. Uh, so that's why only parks come today. And we were intended to invite the DDC and other agencies to come. We, we invited Mox and they refused. Hmm. Mox, yeah. May, may I comment on that for a minute? Sure. Uh, this isn't the first time I've seen where the department, Parks Department, has been honestly left out on its own uh, as opposed to being accompanied by leadership in the administration or other city agencies that it does projects with. I think that's unfair. Um, they, they're not solely responsible for a lot of these projects. And while I appreciate what the council is doing to try to uh, encourage representation from these other agencies, um, I also know as advocates we have a part to play as well, and I would welcome discussion after this about how we can bring these other entities to the table so that, frankly, all of us don't have to sit through a fifth hearing for four hours about the same subject without the right parties at the table. It's not fair to you. It's not fair to us, especially given the work that the Council has done with us and the Playfair Coalition in raising money for the Parks Department. Thank you. So, Councilmember Cohen, you have a question. Right? Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I have to admit that uh, when I saw the topic today, I was a little... Uh, but, you know, one thing that... <clears throat> you know, several years ago, I at least I thought I had an idea about how to possibly and, and make the process better. And as I look through this, like, you know, saying that they need more money or they say that that's deck chairs on the Titanic. And I don't know if you guys have it like this is a legislature. If there is a law or there's something we could do to make the process better. I have really been, it, those answers don't seem to be forthcoming from you know, as many hearings as we've had on the topic. Like, no, you know, other than you know, throwing more money at it does not really seem, I don't think any of us are enthusiastic about that, but no one has ever come to me and said, you know, the charter puts this burden on whether it's all capital agencies or just parks, and if there was a change in the charter this way, that would help. Mm -hmm. Or that the state legislature has this requirement, if they would change it, 
you know, we know people in the state legislature. We, you know, we could help, but it, th those ideas have not been really forthcoming from the administration or from advocates. So mm -hmm. I, I think that there's a frustration all around. May I respond to that, Council Member? So I remember well when you came and discussed with us your proposal at the time was legislature at the state for a version, I, I think you were calling it the Parks Construction Authority. So it was a version of how SCA is currently modeled and handles their parks projects, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and we listened and there were components of your uh, proposal and your, your legislation that we thought uh, were, would be incredibly helpful in streamlining the process. If you recall, the one point where we disagreed as advocates is in streamlining the process, it was also removing the pieces of the public process, which to an advocate is removing our voice at the process. So we, couldn't, we had to agree to disagree on uh, that moment in time. I do think there's a role for advocates, the council, um, and if the administration is not willing um, to sit down with us, I mean, I would love to have a meeting where we jointly go in to Deputy Mayor Bean and we say this is not just parks, this is a, a larger issue. We come up with, uh, if it's not an eventual charter change, I mean, you have to crawl before you walk and walk before you run, and I think that there is, um, there needs to be a recognition on behalf of the other side of City Hall that there's a genuine problem that needs to be fixed. It can't, you're absolutely correct, it can't be on any one of our shoulders. We have ideas, but this is gonna take a movement, I think, to change. Um, and while there's been best practices at other agencies that have helped speed things along, um, it still, to me, has there's a great void in the room to not have the other mayoral entities, oversight entities, uh, it, particularly in the procurement process. Um, I mean, that's a, that's a short-term fix. It's, it's because it's all under the control of the mayor. It's not law in some cases, with the exception of the controller. It's policy. And we, as a group, should be driving and working together on policy and policy improvements. So this is not gonna get fixed overnight. You're 100% right. But I do think we can do better than we're doing today and continuing to point the finger at the Parks Department after they are legitimately trying to make improvements just doesn't seem the best use of anyone's time. Thank you. Councilman Kalos. Uh, so I've been contracts chair, I think, uh, of about eight months now. <laughs> <laughs> so this is this is my first go around. I want to thank the Center for an Urban Future. We I cited your uh, study in my opening statement and, and New Yorkers for Parks. Uh, in terms of uh, wanting to know where the process is, uh, as part of Passport, which the city has been working on since this mayor came in, uh, and the next version, uh, everyone's supposed to be moved off Vendex by April. So uh, we invite you to our April hearing on Vendex, uh, sorry, over the new passport, because we wanna make sure that there are public facing features where you should be able to track that. That being said, if you are interested, the city law already says you can pull these documents and track these contracts by going to the 253 Broadway. I will give you a news flash that if you try, you won't succeed, but if you were to try and weren't able to succeed, I'd be interested in working with you and resolving the issue and even being a party to your litigation if you so chose. <laughs> uh, that being said, they're Noted. saying April for compliance with a 20-year-old law. Uh, so I wanna thank you for that. Um, and uh, I guess, what, what are your thoughts on the fact that they have, uh, they're operating at a 50-person deficit for design and that it takes mm -hmm. up to 12 months to assign uh, a project for design. Uh, I would be happy to address that and then perhaps I know because this is a subject that Eli and I both worked on together. So uh, you obviously know um, we're grateful to the council for funding many positions having to do with maintenance and operations at the Parks Department vis-a-vis -vis the funding that was approved last June through the Playfair Coalition which New Yorkers for Parks led. And we're gonna be back just so I forewarn everyone Playfair is coming back in the next year. But what I will say to that is if you've ever been to, and I, I would encourage you, and I'm saying this without having the permission of the Parks Commissioner, um, so I'm putting you on the spot, Commissioner, but I would encourage you to take a visit to the Olmstead Center where a lot of the Capital Programs unit operates out of. They're operating out of trailers. Conditions are very difficult there, and they've been operating at a deficit of staff for some time. So it's no surprise 
that there's a backlog of projects. And it is, in fact, accurate that you can't launch all projects at the same time. Um, does that mean there can't be improvements made? Absolutely, you're 100% correct. But I think, you know, I will tell you, having been to these locations and worked with some of these individuals from the other side, I ran a cultural organization for six years that had 50 million in capital investments vis-a-vis -vis cultural affairs and parks. Uh, and it's very difficult to attract talent um, when you have a department that is woefully understaffed, underfunded, and under-resourced in terms of their location. So Parks is doing the best it can with what it has, but I wouldn't be surprised if that reflects some of the omissions in staffing. I, uh, so as a, whether you're in for-profit, non-profit, or government, uh, you have a throughput. So for my office, I know that we do 2,000 constituent service cases every single year. And so we know that our throughput is anywhere between 20 and 200 cases any given couple of weeks. And so we've been able to manage all of those cases as they come in, because if you don't, you lose your job. So I guess if we know that the park's throughput is currently 100, at a minimum of 100 projects every year, uh, doesn't that mean that we should have the staffing for 100 people? And whether it's, it's launching, like, help me, and, and this design process does take mm -hmm. uh, six to 10 months, so it seems like it's a no-brainer that we should have the staff to launch 100 projects concurrently. And I, I like the IBO to comment too, but I don't see why you can't launch 100 projects concurrently. It's just a matter of having the adequate staffing to handle the throughput. That's literally a, I'm a systems architect, that's bandwidth, that's all that means. So this is really good information because right now New Yorkers for Parks in the next three weeks are meeting with the members of the Playfair Coalition um, to start to put together our advocacy platform for Playfair for this next budget cycle. And uh, surely they've had frustrations with the length of time in the capital process and staffing is a big piece of that. So duly noted as we move forward in putting together our advocacy work. And to IBO, does it make sense to have enough staff to handle 100 concurrent projects that are coming down the pike every single year? Yeah, I, I believe that probably makes sense. I'm gonna speak, I have a couple different hats here. I worked at the council for many years, uh, actually dealing with parks department projects for most of that time and dealing with um, these same issues. And I haven't been at the council for nine years and I started there 15 years before. So I, this has been going on for a long time. Um, I will say though that in my experience, one of the issues, and, and to give the parks department a little bit of credit on this, is that, um, and I think they still do this, is that they do a little outreach to the members to try to have, I, I, can't, I can't vouch for the fact that they still do this, but they did it in my time, uh, that they used to do outreach to members prior to, um, or during the budget process, to give them kind of a, a little bit of, um, understanding of what's a, what types of projects are available in their districts. I don't know if they still do that with you. Yes. Uh, and, and providing some sort of scope and, and, and estimate of, of, contra of, of project costs. I know when I was at the council, they often came back with, uh, we, we'd often come back with lots of projects that they didn't actually scope out. They didn't have time to um, give project costs to, and we would give them about a week or two to come back to us with projects, with estimates. Um, and and th that would be done through OMB. I know that probably having more staff would enable them to do better, better cost estimates, but they often came back to us saying that th this was too short a period of time to, to give that. So I, I do agree that more staff would probably allow them to do a better job. Uh, I think though that, you know, to find a perfect solution for this is probably never going to, you know, trust me, I, I would love to have more staff as well. I'm sure you guys uh, would as well. But the fact is that in this city, we can't hire people uh, expeditiously. That's a whole other issue that IBO is actually looking into. Um, the, just, just the process of hiring in this city, I mean, you wanna go on to it, you could have a whole hearing on that. Um, I don't wanna necessarily get into that here, but I, and I don't know specifically these 50 positions we haven't looked at, but I'm assuming that relative to other city agencies, they're probably around the same percentage of vacancies. So uh, long answer, short, or short, long, long answer to your short question, yes, 
they probably could do better with more people and more heads filled, but I, yeah. Council Member Gibson. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony and really for all of the work you do. Um, a lot of great suggestions here and I appreciate you being honest as you have been. I mean, we've talked about this extensively a lot and as I meet with the Bronx Parks Commissioner and her staff every three months and we go over all of my park projects, whether they're funded by the council or not, and we talk about timeline, we talk about public-private partnerships. And so I guess that's my question to you is, you know, obviously there is so much more that we can do when you talk about park upgrades and park renovations, and these parks are very expensive. And I am always looking at the timeline that I have and trying to achieve as much as I can, at least lay the foundation so that my successor can come in and really complete a lot of these park projects. So in our district in the Bronx, we've been able to work with private partners. I mean, I'm blessed to represent Yankee Stadium. So the New York Yankees have been very supportive of renovating my basketball courts, some of my rec center, and you know, looking at other ways, working with you know MSG, the New York Lit Knicks, Lady Liberties. I mean, I am willing to work with any and everybody as long as we are of the same mindset where we want to invest dollars to help kids and families. And so I guess I'm asking is public-private partnerships is the way that you know we try to get more uh, private dollars to really look at a public benefit. So what would you suggest to us in terms of all of the recommendations you've talked about, which we will continue to talk about, but how can we tap into the private industry so that we can really get more investments for our parks and really programming too. Um, in the Bronx, I've been able to work with the Bronx Lacrosse. We have a skate park. We have a lot of different things. It's not just baseball and basketball, but we're also looking at other things that kids are doing and it's not always exposed to. There's this big momentum in the Bronx that we may be getting a soccer stadium and that's great because kids love to play soccer but we don't have a lot of field space. Um, and so I just wanted to ask that to you all since you work with a lot of private partners where you see the council and, and the administration tapping into that industry. May I? Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, great question. It's something that we think about a lot, too, in terms of our advocacy work and partnerships, and it's something I've thought about in roles uh, in Coney Island and Snug Harbor and other parks I've been affiliated with. Um, my recommendation would be is if you haven't yet met or familiarized yourself with um, City Parks Foundation, they are the nonprofit arm for programming and raising funds uh, for programming and parks, which you mentioned, and I think also they have a good sense of the corporate partners that may be out there and interested. And um, I would also say it, there are local commu uh, community organizations and CBOs, probably which you're very familiar with in your own district, um, that may have done some research as to what are the pillars. You know, every corporation now has corporate social responsibility pillars that they're looking to fill. And often environment or parks or health fall into one of those pillars. And it's a unique opportunity to identify funding for smaller organizations to go after and to secure. But it does take a conversation on both sides and I also think a recognition that identifying and securing healthy public-private partnerships is more of an art than a science and takes time. So it's there, it can be done, but it, it, there's a setting of expectations as you go into it. Thank you. I would just very quickly add, I think as, as part of you know, the, the oversight role in this, in this issue, um, it's incredibly important to make sure that the least attractive, least sort of sexy parts of parks infrastructure get the attention that they deserve. And I think one of the challenges with the public-private partnership model around parks funding is that you may find that it's easier to kind of leverage that sort of support um, for something new where you get to have the experience of building something a community didn't have already and opening it to the public versus some of the issues where capital dollars do come into play in a major way, but they don't reach that kind of level of visibility, whether that's a drainage system or a retaining wall. And so I think as part of that conversation, absolutely echo everything that um, 
that Lynn mentioned, and certainly the Parks Foundation, City Parks Foundation would be a great place to kind of see that grow and be able to expand across all five boroughs and hit, hit every community with those resources, but to also balance that out with the need that when you need to replace and potentially we have, you know, hundreds if not thousands of, of retaining walls that may need to either be significantly repaired or fully restored in the years ahead, we have drainage systems that are 50, 60 years old mm -hmm. and that flood every single time that there's a storm, you know, that may be difficult to, to, really, uh, alley, to really leverage uh, private dollars to kind of tackle those issues, but I think it speaks to the value of that citywide needs assessment that the number one recommendation I would make is make sure that the department itself is empowered to really assess its own needs and prioritize based on nothing more than long-term cost versus short-term cost. If you can solve a problem now that would metastasize into a much bigger problem down the road, that's where we should be putting those capital dollars. But that may not be, that may be in conflict with what a, a council member might be most interested in because that's what the community wants, what a, a foundation might be interested in, what a, a private funder might be interested in. I think in all of this, we have to prioritize the needs that are most acute because that's where the real problems are in the system as opposed to what may be you know, uh, expeditious in terms of funding opportunities, but boy, it might cost us much more as a city down the road if we leave those problems unaddressed. May I okay. tie two things mm -hmm. together yep, from sure. what we said, which I think is really important to underscore. We've, we've spoken about this needs assessment for a long time, just to kind of play this out. So the rate at which the Parks Department is currently being funded to complete this needs assessment, essentially the planning tool to do yeah. the capital yeah. projects, we're talking 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. So fast forward 20, <laughs> right. <laughs> so <two>. by the <laughs> time it's done, the needs have changed, the communities have changed, the infrastructure has changed, there's been additional climate change. So. There, there's a key conversation that needs to be had over the expense dollars it's going to take to complete these needs assessment because Eli's right. I, as running a nonprofit, have a business plan which shows for the next five years where I'm going, and I take it to funders, I take it to donors, I take it to corporations, and I say, help me get there. That needs assessment is part of what Parks Department should be leveraging to help all of us and our communities get there. But at the rate at which it's going, we're going to be waiting a long time. Mm -hmm. Understand. I just wanted to uh, share an idea that's been uh, happening over the past couple of weeks. Um, the district attorneys in three of our counties have been working uh, with the Department of Education, and it's a new initiative called Saturday Night Lights. Mm. And I look at it like midnight basketball. It's just at Saturday night at 6 o'clock, not midnight. And we are looking at schools and underutilized gymnasiums. And the idea is to bring basketball and soccer and other activities for young people that normally don't have a lot to do on Saturdays. Some of the PALs and the Kipps Bay Boys and Girls Clubs and other places are not open Saturday nights. So the idea behind this is to provide a mechanism by which young people can engage in activities on the weekends. And so I'm working with them and we'll be having a conversation to look at some of our rec centers as well that may not be open on Saturday night so we can do this Saturday night light component. But it's just all in the same spirit. Um, because capital and, to me, programs are equally as important. I care about the infrastructure, but I also care about what's inside, too. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our boroughs, you know, just don't always have access to programs on the weekend hours, and, you know, we're trying to build up so that there are more opportunities. So I thought that was a pretty interesting idea, and I'm looking forward to, you know, that um, percolating and moving even further in, in other neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you for your participation, and we really appreciate your input your, and your advocacy for, on this. Thank you. Thank you, Council Members. We appreciate you focusing on this. Thank you. <clears throat> the next panel will be Jessica Morris, uh, Maria Volker, uh, Michael Pato. Uh, we are also joined by Councilmember Menchaka. Hmm? No? Bruce? Oh, no, no. Yeah, Bruce, okay. You can join us. Yeah. We are missing one, right? Uh, please limit your testimony to less than five minutes. Okay? Yeah, no problem. We are running out of time. And 
You can start after you identify yourself. Yeah, Bruce, yeah. Good afternoon. Stop. You know, you know, thanks for letting me testify in front of you. My name is Bruce Jacobs, Coalition of the Rockaways, U.S. Navy veteran, 9-11 first responder, fighter for the Rockaways in Southeast Queens and all of New York City. I'm uh, also medical and religious freedom. Now, I really wanted to ask him a question. My thing with going private, I want my youth. It seems in my neighbor, diversified neighborhood of Rockaways and Southeast Queens, we're being messed over. We don't get nothing. Everything is pushed off to somebody else. I don't like privatization. Privatization, all it goes is to nonprofits that put the money into their pockets. I like what Ms. Gibson said about big corporations. They put money into neighborhoods to try to help. I don't like little corporations. In my neighborhood, little corporation, you go to the Parks Department, if it ain't the Parks Department, then you have to be a member of their club. If you're not a member of their club, then you feel funny going to it. In his saying about contracts being pushed, there's no possibility that it could be pushed because if, you let, if you're pushing contracts, I was in construction, I worked for the uh, Transit Authority for 30 years. You push contracts and you get corruption. Corruption, and then what do you do? You have to investigate the contracts. If you don't investigate the contracts and you hire the wrong, thing, wrong people, you know, you're in a lot of trouble. In, uh, in my neighborhood of Far Rockaway, we're going through that. And, like, you know, everyone thinks, you know, everybody wants this. We want our parks built. We want our recreation centers built. But we want the parks department to do it, not private corporations. Private corporations, like I said, it leads into all kind of stuff. We have the infrastructure and the parks department and everything all goes hand in hand. The funds can't keep on going up because the city has no money. If they have no money to fix the boilers in buildings, you know, they have no money. They have no money to fix the schools, they have no money. They have no money to put on the streets for protection, for the law and order, for our people, and my people of Nicers, and my people of, you know, Redfern, and my people of Far Rockaway, and my people of the Hamill Projects. Yes, we want parks, but we also want law and order. So, you know, the idea of, I want the parks department to put improvements, to, to, to put up a portable, you know, t temporary bathroom, that's no good. That's just gonna be a waste of money that's gonna lead into other stuff. You need a permanent solution. If you're just gonna put up a, a temporary and that's gonna cost you two million, the money ain't going from the work. The money's going on designing, the money's going on the contract looking out. The community should have an opportunity to look into it because he was saying, oh, it's taken long for the community, it's taken long for the other organization. No, they have to take long. If you give a contract and it's not the right person, what are you gonna do then? Then it's gonna cost you triple the money. So you're better off that you find proper. I'm all for parks being fixed up. I want the bathrooms in the, in the, in the Rockaways and all over New York to be fixed up not these monstrosities that they put up, that they're temporary structures, but you know, I really want it. I care about my neighborhood, I care about my New York City, but our quality of life is in a lot of difficult. I appreciate the things that you guys do. I know you guys are just doing your job, but not everything is what kind of person you are, or this or that. Everybody is from one person. You know, we're, you know, I don't want to talk God, but we're all the same. And I just want to see our New York City go back to law and order. And I want the right development, not just, you know, you know, pushing it to somebody. You can't bundle. If you bundle and give somebody a contract for a hundred places, to me, that's going to lead into corruption. And, you know, the coalition of the Rockaways will work with the council to try to make things good. And I want to thank you very much for letting me testify. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Ku, Chair Gibson, Chair Kalos, members of the committee, and thank you for your invitation to testify. My name is Michael Plotel. I'm a practicing architect and co-chair of the Public Architecture Committee of the American Institute of Architects New York chapter, also known as AIA New York. Since its founding in New York City in 1857, AIA New York has served as the leading professional membership association for licensed architects, emerging professionals, and allied partners in our city. AIA New York and its more than 5,600 members seeks to advance design and livability in our, in our nation's cities. We applaud the recently enacted modifications to the Department of Parks and Recreation's capital procurement process. Expense budgeting of pre-design activities, such as site testing, programming and planning ensures projects move ahead with realistic budget and schedule goals. Publishing the capital projects database on the agency's website promotes transparency, accountability, and trust in the work of the Parks Department. We propose additional improvements to the process without undermining the principles of transparency, equity, and value that inform public procurement. Amending Local Law 63 of 2011 so that procurements advance concurrently with administrative review and approval as opposed to sequential review and approval will accelerate project delivery without undermining the goals of the law. Similarly, pre-approval or concurrent review of vendor responsibility, whether unified under a single lead agency and or a responsibility database, will improve delivery time by shortening the lag between bid opening and contract award. Finally, qualifications-based selection, currently used for consultants mostly, must also apply to construction contracts. This will open a path for agencies to select the most qualified contractors for each project's unique scope and characteristics, raising the level of professionalism, effectiveness, and efficiency in executing public projects. City procurement rules, which bind all mayoral agencies, exist to ensure a level, open, and transparent marketplace for all vendors, while concurrently ensuring that the city gets the best value for every capital dollar. Recent developments have advanced these goals, and we look forward to continued progress. Thank you for inviting us to testify. Next, now, please. Good afternoon, um, Chairman Ku, Callis, Gibson, and supporting staff. Thank you. I'm Maria Roca. I'm the founder and um, chair of the Friends of Sunset Park in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, um, and um, I have changed my testimony like three times as the, after the morning and then the afternoon went on because other people have said some of the things and so I'm trying to avoid to repeat. But um, I am here representing thousands and thousands of people who make use of every square inch of green space in Sunset Park, not only the park itself, which is named like the neighborhood, we're very original in Sunset Park, but also the other, the, a number of pocket parks and also um, the park by the waterfront also. Still not enough because our, our neighborhood, you probably know, is overcrowded on every uh, category that you can imagine whether it be housing, whether it be school seats, whether it be transportation, we are on top of each other in every moment of our lives. So green space, of course, is most important to us, quality um, green space. But I'm also here in support of the um, very dedicated work and uh, that we call of the New Yorkers for Parks, Partnerships for Parks, and the Municipal Art Society, with whom we collaborate, and they've always very welcoming for our perspective and our participation. So for that, we are thankful because that's where, how we get smarter in how we advocate for our park, because those are the experts. Um, so I'm going to speak mostly about, uh, well, emphasize, and I cannot overemphasize the importance of working collaboratively with parks patrons by the parks department, particularly on uh, capital projects. Um, it has not always been as productive as we think it could have been and as um, financially speaking, as, um, as cheap as it could have been in, in the end. Um, let's speak about, uh, we had a major playground project and um, 
the, the thoughts of the children and their parents were totally ignored. And uh, it seemed like the decision had been made by the designers that this is the kind of park in their head that we needed. So we're being told what we need when our families are the ones using the park every day. A very small playground given the population that uses it, mind you. So the parks were almost unanimously against a sandbox in the, in the park for a variety of reasons. There's not enough space, you know, with space, less space for running around, and the maintenance and health um, aspects of it, because the Parks Department, as many have said here, the the um, maintenance part of Parks Department is underfunded. So it's not just building it, but how are you going to maintain it so that the children are healthy and safe? Um, there was also the issue of a water feature right next to the sandbox. Imagine that. I don't know what university they graduated from, but I can tell you I didn't go to design school, but you don't put a water feature, spray uh, feature next to a, a sandbox. What happened? That sand managed to get out of the sandbox, <coughs> wet feet, <coughs> even on a, a rain event, and clogged all of the drains in the playground. So now it falls to maintenance of the parks department to fix a problem that was a design problem to begin with, which the parents were against. The lay people said, you can't do that. Because, and we, ex I, my son is an adult now, but the parents of young children explained of why it wouldn't work. The designers were hell-bent. Sandbox is going in, if you don't like it, that's your problem. Not exactly in those words, but the attitude was there. Um, we didn't appreciate that. Now, mind you, just about every penny of every capital project that has gone into Sunset Park in the last three, four years has been participatory budget money. Where the community, we are a community, uh, District 38 has had the highest voting on participatory budget. So we are intimately involved in this process. It's not that the money showed up out of nowhere and here you are, here's the money. We are, so it is important. We watch the projects. We are out there when the work, when the construction workers, we are the ones who report the problems. We watch, we are involved. We don't, exp we don't believe in top down. It's our park, it's our families. And I, whatever we can do, whatever you, well, we're doing as much as we can do, whatever you can do to sort of reinforce that aspect of capital projects by any, you know, by parks or any other agency, if we were talking about other agencies, <clears throat> that is so important because people really then don't trust government. Thank and you. And that's a shame. Thank, Thank you, you, Maria. Yeah. Thank you for all your input and suggestions. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? Thank you. So we are going to the last panel. Corey Provost, Adam Martinez. Uh, Adam Martindale. Uh, any more part participation? If anyone wants to participate, please fill our slip and give it to the sergeant of arms. Oh. Thank you. Please identify yourself and start. Oh. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening. Good afternoon. My name is Corey Provost. I'm the director of government affairs for Prospect Park Alliance. I'm here on behalf of Susan Donahue, who serves as the administrator and the president of uh, the Prospect Park Alliance. I am uh, definitely my pleasure to be able to submit this testimony today. As you may know, Prospect Park Alliance is a non-for-profit that partners with New York City Parks Department and the community to foster stewardship of Prospect Park. Established in 1987, uh, the Alliance helps to care for the natural environment, preserve the park's historic design, provide facilities, as well as oversee over 25,000 permanent events uh, annually. Over the last 31 years, the Alliance has played a pivotal role in restoring the park to its original glory. During this time, we have worked closely with the mayor, uh, the speaker, Corey Johnson, borough president, Eric Adams, majority leader, Combo, council members, Lander and, and Eugene, and the entire Brooklyn delegation. 
and the communities that really surround Prospect Park. We are uh, listening to all the, the testimonies today, you know, we definitely want to applaud all the recent efforts that the New York City Parks Department has made to has made to, for commitments to enhance and, uh, and improve the, pro the capital process. Um, one effort that we would be strongly supportive of is providing the Parks Commissioner with access to a significant annual discretionary capital budget. Unfortunately, as you, uh, many of you may be aware, many improvements, generally infrastructure projects like drainage pipes, do not receive the same amount of attention as what a new playground or a comfort station. If the commissioner had uh, such a discretionary capital budget to work with, uh, we believe the agency could start to move forward uh, more quickly on vitally needed infrastructure improvements that have struggled to receive funding um, from to receive funding over the last uh, years. We also understand that there are a variety of factors that slow down capital projects that are beyond the control of the Parks Department. Um, as I believe Lynn Kelly said in an earlier testimony, the Office of Management and Budget, the Mayor's um, Office of Contracts, the Corporation Council, to name a few, all play a very vital and crucial role in pushing forward capital projects. And we want to emphasize that looking at these processes holistically to determine opportunity areas outside of parks purview for improving the capital process is something that we should definitely be focusing on. And just further understanding that park projects across the five boroughs are constantly facing budget deficits due to ever increasing cost of capital projects with contractors being able to essentially set the cost standards for projects and the reality of it being just very expensive generally to build anything in New York City. We think therefore strongly that the council should be looking at this in a very holistic approach at all the agencies that have a play a role in moving forward capital projects. Thank you. Madam Chairwoman, um, honorable members, um, thank you for hosting this oversight committee. Uh, my name is Adam Martinek. I'm the founder and executive director for Inland Hill Park Conservancy. Um, I do research work in coordination with um, the New York Botanical Garden. Um, so the New uh, Inland Hill Park Conservancy is a not-for-profit operating within Manhattan's northernmost green space, which is called the Shirakapak Conservancy. Um, it is a area of 145 acres. Um, <clears throat> so we organize sustainable restoration initiatives, um, usually involving low-tech civil engineering projects, such as building flood wall barriers to reduce um, beach-bound trash deposits and the insulation of retaining walls to control for erosion. Um, our group was formed to promote the environmental health of Inwood Hill Park and to protect its fauna and flora against long-term threats, such as anthropogenic disturbances, um, which is human disturbance um, in addition to canine activity, um, invasive species, soil erosion, and acidification. Um, very much the unsexy issues that were described earlier. Um, since 1995, Inland Hill Park's beautiful landscape has been maintained by Northern Manhattan Parks Department in conjunction with the New York City Urban Park Rangers. Um, the National Resources Group coordinated a restoration project that profoundly improved the park's ecosystem between 2001 and 2003, um, and they conducted a study that identified every tree, shrub, and herbaceous plant within the Shirakapak Nature Preserve. Um, the data collected by NRG was strong enough to launch this conservancy, and uh, this story has been an example of how some and many of the innumerable benefits of a robust community park infrastructure um, and the contribution to public research, which is something that other institutions are able to take up and pick up on their own. Um, on October 29, 2012, New York City was hit by an extra tropical aftermath storm in the wake of Hurricane Sandy that devastated Long Island Sound and many other places. On that day, Inwood Hill Park's nature center was flooded and damaged um, and through rot was in need of repair. Um, New York City's Parks Department has issued an intent of rebuilding the center. Community board hearings have been held and design meetings were held. Um, on October 29th of 2019, just a week ago, I submitted testimony before the Committee on Parks and Recreation, before Councilmember Kalos, um, describing the need to invest forest management as a means of coastal resiliency and safeguarding against the deleterious impact of climate change. What was not said, and what I will say today, is that it has been over seven years since Sandy began um, the restoration work and cleanup. That was under the previous administration and not Mayor de Blasio. And 
in Willow Park is still without a nature center, the park and the park has suffered for it. Well, without a base of operations, the urban park rangers have been unable to perform um, operations on the scale and magnitude necessary to affect meaningful change in badly hit areas. Fewer data collection missions are carried out and the public loses sight of the problems that occur on a federal basis um, in the face of this. Um, it is without hesitation that I say the nature center has been a management disaster. NYC Parks has tried to deliver on its promise to Community Board 12 for five years, and between uh, the council and the, um, the CEDC's implementation process, um, which I have not seen equal scrutiny for, has taken a disorderly amount of time to complete. I recognize that this is a uniform process, and I respect the design, procurement, and construction process that the park has laid out in the way of being more transparent. And I do not dispute that these rules are necessary while it is true that some agencies have less scrutiny and more leniency to operate than others. Um, I will say that there is a, a, a real benefit to supporting um, public works and that this is in, ultimately for the public. So I would therefore have you consider the interest in having these park amenities provided in a timely capacity and added to the list of priorities met by subcommittees um, and okay, the Committee on Parks and Recreations as this is ultimately their work. Um, I will add one final conclusion in this in that as a constituent at the mercy of the council for all things, I have very little interest in hearing how other departments in the mayor's office are not complying with council regulations. You know, I'm sure there's appropriate mediums for that, finance committee oversight hearings. It is just not a forum when public, when citizens are coming here, spending four hours of their time listening in on council hearings, trying to get the best for their area, and listening to blaming a minister who is here representing the parks and only the parks. He's not representing the CDC. He's not representing all these other institutions. So I know without taking any one perspective, I would love to suggest that we keep it confined to the questions that they are able to answer as it's beneficial to us. We want to hear that. We don't want to hear your grievances with other agencies. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your participation. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. I'm sorry, you guys are, I believe, the last panel for this hearing, and it's been raised by a number of other panels, and I just wanted to get clarification and understanding what the ask is. Um, there's been talk about this parks discretionary capital budget. So what I wanna understand from both of you that represent a number of advocates and, and residents is, does that mean we want the parks department's capital budget to be separate from the normal capital process where there is oversight through OMB and the other agencies. What, what exactly are we talking about and um, do we expect to gain ground on that in terms of the reality of what we're dealing with? So if we can table the idea of you know where parks funding ultimately goes that it, it, once it's approved, we have what the park ultimately, ultimately operates with is, is earmarked dollars, which is that they have um, appropriations pre-approved for particular needs. They're met over an extended period of time, and if they're met, that's great. If they're not, they'll be up here before an oversight committee. Uh, what I'm proposing and what I think others are is that it would be similar to the borough president's office in that they do pass they do not readily pass like policy, but they have a discretionary budget for which they're able to use in capital allocations and give to various institutions as they see fit. Um, I think the, the borough president shares, five borough presidents share 1% of the budget, which was $92.8 billion last year. So they have about a considerable amount of discretionary funding before them to allocate for these purposes. I think if the park had the same leniency, they could see a lot more projects um, accomplished with a lot more alacrity. And uh, I can't speak with, for other institutions, but it certainly seems appropriate if you don't immediately pass policy on your own to have a discretionary budget to be able to fund the things that do not, that we don't have to come here and each time and sit and go back and forth as to whether a million dollars here or a million dollars there could be spent. Indeed, if there's a discrepancy in the perceived transparency, that's a different subject but I don't think there is any harm in promoting um, a discretionary budget. 
Just to add in, I, I definitely agree with everything that he was just mentioning. Um, as it relates to the, the alliance and what we see as something just that would be really good going forward, if the parks did have that, that ability, that access, it would be, I think, very transformative going forward. Are there any more members who want to participate? Seeing none, this meeting will be adjourned.